Hamo Myohorengeko. Hello, friends. Thank you for being here. Thank you for your practice. Um, we're going to read a, uh, I think we'll get through the whole thing today from uh, How Those Aspiring to the Way Can Attain Buddhahood Through the Lotus Sutra, Through the Myohorengeko. This is a short one written to a woman again. Um, and I, you know, not to make any special point of that, but ladies, um, I don't need to discuss with you ad nauseum the uh, differences in perception, status, cultural, so on and so forth, men and women. And we are talking now uh, with Nietzsche's writings about medieval Japan. So, hello. Even today, very misogynistic country, right? Um, and I, I've noticed something in, you know, we have hundreds and hundreds of videos on this channel, talks um, and podcasts on Nietzsche's writings. Treatises, which are very technical and quoting from all over the map, certainly Buddhist teachings and non-Buddhist teachings, which is what we're emulating. We're emulating Nietzsche, right? Uh, and then there's letters to uh, close, you know, other monks, conversioning monks, uh, samurai, uh, some are very targeted at a certain person, like Shijo Kingo, for instance. Others are given to leaders in different areas of Japan uh, for the purpose of dissemination. So there's a different tone to those. They're scholastic without being a treatise. And then there are quite a few, surprised me, how many letters that uh, some very involved that Nietzsche wrote to uh, the women, the mothers, the daughters, the wives of samurai, the wives, <coughs> some who had lost uh, their husbands to battle to medieval Japan. Um, and I make a note of that because, because of this cultural difference and because women ask different questions than men ask certainly in that situation right a samurai is asking about how to practice buddhism to be <laughs> he's a warrior in the business of life and death not very buddhist and trying to practice to get his head right around what his life is about but a woman, even then as now, concerned about more social, I would say, human-to-human -human questions, everything from menstruation, yes, letters about that, um, and a woman's, the proper behavior to have when practicing. When, uh, when chanting, when, when recitation is involved, uh, what's the proper way to do that? Should I do it on certain days? Should I do this how much? And I find that there's a, it's not universal, but there's a tendency in these go shows that I read when they're addressing women that I find a little bit more relatable, a little more, more personal. Is that just me? Um, I think Nietzsche, though he was compassionate for every one of uh, his followers and, and the nation, even those who didn't follow him, his tenderness, I'll say, in you know, relating stories, teachings, so on to women, it has a different tone. And I thought, you know, it may be worth and you tell me what you think, but I've been working on this, and yesterday I put a new book, a new collection on the bookstore, 
available in print. It's like 400 pages. So it's, you know, it's not cheap because printing paper, trees, so on. But I also made a, an ebook copy. I put it on the threefoldlotus.com site, the ebook page, of Letters to Women, Nietzsche and Gosho. Just went through as many Goshos as I could find in the Zenshu, anyway, that were addressed to moms and daughters and so on and so forth, and put them in one volume, a collection of Goshos. I think there's an exception in there where it's like for everyone, but still it was either a response to a woman or for a family, you know, a woman, so on. But generally they're all addressed to specific women simply because I think there's a different tone. And I also think for you modern women, um, that might be a useful resource. We all have sentient minds, you know, disclaimer here. It's not that you're different from men or men, you're different from women in your Buddhist practice, in your abilities, same thing. But in the questions and the way we understand life and the advice we might want to call for our practice, women have a different point of view. And so I thought, well, for you ladies out there, maybe a collection of Nietzsche's writings that are specifically written in response to women's queries or women's issues, you know, most of them you'll find are just universal. But where they're not, maybe that you can draw some confidence, some inspiration from those. So uh, the book is called Letters to Women, Nietzsche and Gosho. Um, it's available at threefoldlowest.com as an ebook, or you can go to the Lulu bookstore and, and get a print copy. One caution, I just published this. I'm waiting for a hard copy myself to go through it. Invariably, no matter how many times, and I've been doing this for over 40 years, no matter how many times I read, reread, not only a, a go show, but a collection that I put together with, my, my, you know, I'm always correcting the language, trying to get religion out of it, right? It's like I was going to say with Nietzsche and Shu, I, I like a lot of things about their sect, but one thing I absolutely abhor is they've adopted all this Christian rhetoric, this religious rhetoric in there with souls and faith. And it's like, what decide what you are. Are you Buddhist or are you Christian? It's insane because the two are as different as oil and water. But somehow the rhetoric, it's, it's a lie. It's a, it's, it's a manipulation and it really, really bugs me. It's not Buddhism. But, you know, they're, I guess they're trying. I psh, that needs to be cleansed, though, from our, and that's that's the main. If there's a central cause to my mission of spreading the and transmitting, as we say in the Gongyo, the correct transmission of Shakyamuni's teachings and Nichiren's teachings, I gotta get that ridiculous religious manipulation, bull hockey. <laughs> you thought I was it. You want, he's going to cuss. The baloney, baloney out of there. Because Buddhism isn't about that mysticism and crap. It's, it's very pragmatic, very straightforward, very experiential. What you can actually experience in your life. Not, ooh, nice clouds. That's not Buddhism. So I do the same with the, all these translations, wherever they come from, of Nietzsche's writings. Because Nietzsche wouldn't have adopted that. Not at all. Uh, it, it might appear in the expedient means because Shakyamuni was talking to people of his day and they were very mystical people, the ancient Indian culture still to this day oh my goodness you know magical elephants i mean come on i you know fine have your magical elephants but it's not buddhism right so expurgate that stuff get that out of there and then you can see clearly much more easily without these distractions 
what Buddhism is about. It's very clear if you get that other crap out of the way. But back to my point, it seems that I can read something 30 times. Okay, I'm publishing it. And then I get back a proof coffee and I read it and I go, how did I how did I miss that? Oh, I have to go back in and do, you know, and how many times, how much energy do I have? I'm getting old, folks. And it's just me. So I can't ask anyone else to proofread it for me. You know, I have the one person who's tremendous, but if I put that on her all the time, she's like, yeah, yeah, I'll get to it. Yeah, put it there. I'll read it. I can't wait for that. I need to get this information out. <laughs> so, so I have to reread it. And, you know, you, we're conditioned, right? So I'll glide right over heinous use of verbiage that I'd later then see and go, ah, you don't say it like that. This is much more in, con in concert with Shakyamuni and Nietzsche and Tendai. Say it like this. So that's my caveat for any of the publications you get. I, I, you know, some of these... Uh, anyway, I'm going on and on and on. But if you do get the book, ebook or print book, um, let me know your thoughts on it. In fact, even if you don't understand what I, uh, if you understand, I'm trying to put together this book uh, of, of Gosho's specifically to those written to women. I think there's value in that. Ladies, let me know. What do you think? Was that a good idea? Or, you know, maybe it's just another source of go shows. They're all go shows for, you know, but I thought it would be useful. Um, and um, just to draw some attention to that, because it is interesting. There's a different tone to them and the uh, questions are different. So anyway, that's out there. All right. Now to this new I've talked so much now, I don't know if I'll have time to go through this whole thing. But from uh, how those aspiring to the way can attain Buddhahood through the Lotus Sutra, it starts with a question. Is there any evidence to indicate that one should embrace in particular the name of the Lotus Sutra in the same way that people embrace the name of a particular Buddha? Now you see right away, this is a woman he's talking to. Like us, what's the first question that you had when you started practicing Nichiren's doctrine of the Lotus Sutra? What's that chanting about? What's that mean? What's Namu Myoho Renge Kyo? What do those words mean? Right? It's like the first, right? We resist. What's that mean? I'm not just going to say it. <laughs> and, and all of that is the wrong rhetoric around it anyway. Of course, we don't know that until we study. So this, this is the question. What evidence is there? What document, what scholarship exists in the 3,000 years of Buddhism that says anything should happen? Um, now, this is the interesting part of the question. By invoking, by chanting the title, the Myoho Renge Kyo, as opposed to chanting the name of a Buddha, like Amida Buddha. What, with our modern, come on. What, what's the difference? Amida Buddha doesn't even exist. He's a, an emanation, an idea, a mental exercise that Shakyamuni used in a sutra or two to talk about emancipation from samsara to get to this new perception, this Buddha land, which is, as we know, if you're Malakirti Sutra, the Buddha land is this land. It's just a shift, a paradigm shift in our experience, in our perception. That's where Buddha takes place in the mind. Oh no, but we're going to run around chanting Amida Buddha's name because that's going to get us to this glorious place where? After we die. What? When did you leave Buddhism? There's that religion thing. No, 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 no. Buddhism is about living this life fully. Get it straight. Before Shakyamuni, before Siddhartha, 
attained his enlightenment, that was his goal. And he didn't start talking about it until he achieved it. It took him like 12 years of research and practice and self, self-analysis and meditation. And then uh, he got it. It's about the mind and how we use our minds to perceive our life. And then down the rabbit hole, right? I say that because to understand that fully is to dissect it. And that's what the scholarship of Buddhism is about. Dissecting this simple truth. That if you simply shift your mind to perceive reality as it's happening moment to moment, instead of investing all your attention, distractions, on ownership, possession, hanging on to, getting more of. That's, that's just the fodder of samsara. That's not where your life really is. Your life is only in this moment, this moment, this moment, moment to moment to moment. If you exist in that flow of momentum, now you're experiencing without restriction the totality of what is life, all life, which is yours. In a nutshell, that's Buddhism. That's happening now, not after you die. That's the, that's the, the, the miasm and mysticism and magical thinking of religions. Buddhism is not that. So here it is in the question. What's the difference between embracing myoho renge Because it's not mere words. It's a whole construct of understanding this renge, this enlightenment, as opposed to just chanting the name of some Buddha. You know the answer. But let's see what he says. Answer. The sutra states, Shakyamuni's own words, quote, the Buddha said to the demon daughters, Excellent, excellent. If you can shield and guard those who accept and uphold the mere name of the Lotus Sutra, the Myoho Rengekyo, hold that deep in your heart. Your merit will be immeasurable. This is from the Lotus Sutra, right? The meaning of this passage is that when the ten demon daughters made a vow to protect those who embrace the title of the Lotus Sutra, the world-honored one of the great enlightenment, praised them, saying, Excellent, excellent, the rewards you will enjoy for protecting those who accept and uphold Namu Myoho Renge Kyo will be impossible to fathom. Not later, not in the next life, to use the parlance, right freaking now. Buddhism is about now. They will be splendid rewards, truly wonderful. How would you know if they're splendid or wonderful if you weren't experiencing them? This passage implies that we ordinary people, you and I, whether we are walking, standing, sitting, or lying down, should chant Namu Myoho Renge Kyo. How much more explicit could he be? That Buddhism, that chanting Namu Myo Renge Kyo is about right now. Do you get it? As for the meaning of Myoho Renge Kyo, also part of your question, right? The Buddha nature inherent in us, it's already there. It's what we are of. We are expressing Buddha nature. It's just our minds that it hasn't gotten with the program. Ordinary people, the Buddha nature of Brahma, Chakra, and the other deities, the Buddha nature of Shariputra, Madhagayana, and the other voice hearers, the Buddha nature of Manjushro, Maitra, and the other bodhisattvas, and the wonderful and difficult to understand law that is the en- enlightenment of the Buddhas of the three existences, are one and identical. So you see what he's... 
He's saying that by chanting Namo Myoren Gekyo, which is Shakyamuni's own advice, that any other practice within Buddhism that you might indulge in is secondary. It's, it's a truth that already exists in Namo Myoren Gekyo. That to chant the others isn't as inclusive. It's only specific to that. Right? It's like if you could hold the entire ocean of the world in your hand. Go with me here. How much more total, uh, what's the word? complete would that holding the ocean be than having a cup of tea oh it's water yeah yeah i know it's water but holding the ocean you hold you own you hold water yeah but i've got this bottle of uh, filtered or uh, bubbly water here good for you but water do you see what i'm saying Let's let him go on. I think he's doing a better job than me. <laughs> this principle is called Myoho Renge Kyo. That everything is of... You are everything and everything is you. Here comes that song again. Therefore, when once we chant Myoho Renge Kyo, with just that single sound, we summon forth and manifest the Buddha nature of all Buddhas. All existences, all bodhisattvas, all voice hearers, all the deities, such as Brahma, Chakra, King Yama, the sun and the moon, and the myriad stars, the heavenly deities and the earthly deities, on down to the hell dwellers, hungry spirits, animals, asuras, humans and heavenly beings, and all other le uh, living beings. This reward is immeasurable and boundless. Now, it excites me to read that because how many times have you heard me say that when we invoke Buddhaness, we instantly become aware, and I know it bends the mind, of every energetic manifestation of the universe. It's what we are. The energy that creates the universe is the same energy that creates you and I down to the subatomic particle. Beyond particles, what are particles? They're just forms of energy. That's been scientifically shown. And it's not a matter of opinion. And when we enlighten our minds, our enlightened Buddha nature, Buddha-ness, that's how we view, experience the entirety of us. Identity. Identity, you are everything. Everything is you. I know that it's just, I know the I can hear the, my mind creaking. Ow! Now don't get magical on me. That doesn't mean that you can spit in your hand and, and shoot out a planet. But it does mean that all of the actions, karma, all of the actions that you take, right? Energy plus action, karma, are just as profound, just as fundamental as a quasar, the formation of a universe, the formation of a planet, the rain falling from the sky, all of these are processes that begin with the transformation of energy. And when your mind is with that process, life becomes completely free, completely untethered to possessions 
and things. They're still there. All the things of samsara are still there, but we understand them with this detached awareness, this amazing awareness that they're just temporary instantiations of potential and that we can move the pieces around and it's entertaining and we can do stuff with them. But life, life, not attached to that stuff. That's just the samsara game we play and what our motives should be instead of always me, 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 me. I'm going to put this here so that I can... I, 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 I. Bodhisattva mind, because of Buddhaness, how can I move this around to influence life-affirming behavior, movement toward Buddhaness, in others? How do I influence my life and the life of others by my actions, my karma, my momentum, which is already sending out waves, aura of energies? If I adjust that more humanly, What would happen to my environment, the people around me? It doesn't have to be with words, it behavior. How my life condition radiates out. And when you're enlightened, when you chant, that's the big aha. That you aren't just some hermetic little flesh ball doing your thing but that you are a radiating energy source <clears throat> that not only experiences, but affects the world around you. Remember Buddhism, there is no separation between self and environment. That sounds good in words, and we go, yeah, 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 I get it. But when we attain Buddhaness, even if we just scratch it, when we're chanting and when we walk away and the world comes in to view, <clears throat> more and more we're influenced ourselves by that enlightenment. And because we're influenced, our life condition changes and we radiate differently. And so then we go, we notice, oh, my life has changed since I've been chanting for a few months. Wow, well, your life hasn't changed. It's just that your, radiant, your life condition has been altered and you're now perceiving much more than you used to because you're allowing your environment to show itself to you instead of you coloring it the way you want it colored all the time. And so you begin to see differently. And gosh, people are starting to behave differently. I wonder why that is. Well, you're different. It all emanates from your practice. Hmm? Bodhisattva. All right. When we revere Myoho Renge Kyo, again, that attitude and intent, inherent in our own life as our objective of our determination, it says object of devotion, but that's misleading, right? Understand what that means is our objective, our goal. When we revere Myoho Renge Kyo, that's not owning, that's respecting. When we edify our Buddha nature, that's our objective of our determination. The Buddha nature within us is summoned forth and manifested by our chanting of Namo Myoho Renge Kyo. I could put that on my refrigerator. Like, that's why I use the word invoke. When we chant Namo Myo Renge Kyo, we are actually experiencing, invoking our Buddha nature. Hmm? This is what is meant by Buddha. 
<laughs> How many times have I said Buddha is not a man? Buddha is a life condition. It's a life condition based on our mental awareness, our mind shifting to Renge, as we've been discussing recently. That aha, oh, this is life. That's Buddha, Buddhaness. That is what is meant by Buddha, Nichiren's words. To illustrate, when a caged bird sings, birds who are flying in the sky are thereby summoned and gather around. And when the birds flying in the sky gather around, the bird in the cage strives to get out. When with our mouths we chant the wonderful and difficult to understand law, our Buddha nature being summoned, or invoking it, will invariably emerge. Now it's an interesting a simile, the bird singing, because what does chant mean? The word chant comes from sing. We are singing our elevated respect and reverence for our instantiation of Buddhaness. Myoho Renge Kyo. Namu, I deeply, with respect, commit myself Namu to invoking my Buddha nature, Myoho Renge Kyo. And when we sing that praise, that reverence, we radiate out, and the Buddha nature of everything around us resonates with us. I'm not making this up, he's saying it. The Buddha nature of Brahma, Chakra, being called, summoned, will protect us, and the Buddha nature of the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas being summoned will rejoice. We will experience the expression of that potential everywhere. We unlock our samsaric mind to this much more aware, already happening awareness. We're just unaware. That's why we call it awakening. It's already there. When you wake up from a dream in your bed, the house doesn't magically manifest. It's been there. Or wherever you're sleeping. Anyway, you get the point. This is what the Buddha meant when he said, quote, if one can uphold it, the wonderful and difficult to understand law, the Myoho Renge Kyo, even for a short while, I will surely rejoice and so will the other Buddhas. This will resonate throughout that life condition, that awareness throughout the universe. All the Buddhas of the three existences, past, present, and future, two, attain Buddhahood by virtue of the five characters of Myoho Renge Kyo. These five characters are the reason why the Buddhas of the three existences appear in the world. Right? This process of life. This mechanism, even in the physical world, exists to experience this very truth. The Renge. The oh yeah, everything is energy in momentum. That's how everything is here in the first place, as a result of this experience. These five characters are the reasons why the Buddhas of the three existences appear in the world. They are the wonderful and difficult to understand law whereby all living beings can attain the Buddha way. You should understand these matters thoroughly and, on the path of attaining Buddhahood, chant Namo Myoho Renge Kyo without arrogance or attachment to biased views. This is your enlightenment. Do it. That's what he's saying. Signed Nitrin. What, I mean... I was singing the praises of uh, that that long one that we read uh, uh, through a few videos, how that alone could be my basis for practice. 
But equally, this short one, it's so to the point that I think if you've been practicing any amount of time and studying, a short one like this kind of just goes, hello, pay attention. It's just this simple. I think we need that one too, right? What a wonderful letter. What a compassionate letter. Yes, you will find that one in the collection on the letters to women. Nietzsche Go Show. I hope you got something out of that. Sometimes the short and sweet can be the most enlightening, the most, oh yeah, that's why I'm doing this, right? A renge in its own. Thank you for listening. Thank you for being here. Thank you for your support. Please, in that, we can use this medium of the internet and YouTube to make this resource more attainable, more available, more searchable and locatable for people who are curious, liking this video, subscribing especially, critically important in our Bodhisattva effort to propagate these teachings. So thank you for doing that. Please take a moment and do that. If you can, some of you have. I'm so grateful to the financial supports through Patreon or, or through PayPal. Um, yeah, paying the bills and buying the equipment. You know how it is. Publishing books. And you guys are immeasurable. I, I don't know how to thank you. Just know that I... I you, I have you in my hearts every day. And uh, as for me, I just want you to keep practicing steadfast, convinced that you're growing your Buddha awareness every day. And in that regard, please take care of your health. Be kind to yourself. This is, life takes effort, no doubt. But the more you practice the more that effort will be supremely, as Nietzsche says, or Shakyamuni says, immeasurably rewarding. So good for you. All right? All right. Take care of yourselves. I will see you in the next one. Bye for now. Mule.